Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here, um, even more so because it's a bit of a home game for us tonight. Um, I'm one of the few portfolio managers actually based in Edinburgh, so I manage the BlackRock Greater European Investment Trust uh, out of an office maybe 800 meters or so from this venue. Um, now, the objective of my presentation tonight um, is really to leave you all with two very distinct impressions. Number one, um, I think I want to leave you the, with the impression that you don't have to be positive uh, on Europe as a region to be invested in European equities. Uh, and secondly, um, this investment trust um, gives, um, gives you um, as savers um, um, access to some unique assets um, that have the potential to create real uh, value for shareholders um, over time. Now, let me start with the um, investment objective of the trust, uh, which is um, to deliver long-term capital growth uh, for our investors. We do this by um, looking our, at our addressable universe of over 2,000 uh, companies listed in Europe, and we boil it down to the 35 to 40 most compelling investment cases uh, we can find. And this means we end up running a relatively concentrated, high-conviction portfolio you know, that gives you access to some of the best companies uh, listed in the region. Now, my job is to um, carefully construct this portfolio uh, of businesses we you know, see as wealth creators, companies that are often uh, dominating their respective markets. Uh, we often call them, um, you know, giant in niches. But I can also um, rely on the support um, of one of the um, most uh, resourced and best resourced teams in the market, the European equity team at BlackRock. Um, it's 20 highly experienced uh, investment professionals. We cover the market um, by sectors, um, and we really leave no stones unturned to find great investment ideas uh, in the region. Um, and I use this resource to address one of the perennial challenges of being an investor in Europe, which is a distinct lack of growth. Um, so I don't think it comes as a surprise to anyone, but you know, Europe as a region is facing some challenges. We all know that there has been a lack of supply-side reforms. Um, we have aging demographics, um, and debt levels in some of the countries are too high. Um, this um, lack of growth potential is also reflected in listed equities, and you can see here decomposition of quite a broad index, which is the stock 600. Um, and what I find interesting is when you move back to about uh, the year 2000, you can see that about 45% uh, of that index was growing in sales by over 8%. If you fast forward to 2018, and um, it's just about uh, over 10% of the index they're growing um, you know, at that level. Um, now, this is where we come in as active investors. Um, so we spend all of our research hours you know, finding the businesses that have the potential to outgrow the market by a considerable amount. Um, and we do this by very carefully thinking about the end market and income streams we're tapping into. We want to make sure that the demand drivers, the companies we invest in, uh, enjoy, um, are sustainable, and give um, them a pathway uh, of growth um, that is really uh, quite attractive relative to the market. And we see plenty of opportunities to deploy capital that way in Europe, um, and we'll give you some, uh, some examples of that in a moment. But let me just start off with our investment philosophy and what it is we look for in the companies we invest in. We're very clear when it comes to our stock picking criteria. Um, we typically look for exceptional management teams that have a you know, um, strong track record in value creation. Uh, we like businesses with a high return on capital employed because we believe it's the compounding nature of those returns that will create value for shareholders over time. We spend a lot of our analysis on um, looking at how much of the net income is being converted into free cash flow because A, it's a sign of uh, clean accounting. It also provides optionality to those businesses to redeploy that cash in growth projects uh, at uh, high returns. So we always look for some growth optionality, and to put it simply, we're looking for something slightly unique. So it could be a certain product, a certain brand, uh, or a certain contact structure. 
Now, let me give you an example. One of the biggest holdings, or the biggest holdings uh, in, the, in, in the trust at the moment, is a French company called Safran. Um, they are the leading, um, world leading producer of airplane engines. Um, they've got about 100% market share on narrow body planes with Airbus, 50% market share with Boeing. They've got an installed base of about 20, 28,000 engines. The beauty of this business model is that the majority of the earnings and cash flows is coming from the aftermarket. And so you have all of those engines in the field. There's very um, strict regulation um, with regards to when they have to come in for maintenance, repair, and overhaul. And so this company has great visibility uh, on their earnings and cash flows and is one of the few companies in Europe that has the confidence to guide on that growth out to 2025, which is pretty uh, unique. Now, let me also tell you a little bit about how we think about the macro environment generally and how macro features in uh, our investment philosophy. Um, and let me start with an observation, because each and every year I find there is a prevailing macro narrative that people worry about, and each and every year um, there is some noise in the market that you know, tempts you to change the composition of your fund. Now, as long-term investors, we take a slightly different approach. Um, we basically build our view of the world from the bottom up, meeting companies across lots of different sectors and industries. We do about 1,200 company meetings per year um, across our team um, with companies in autos, chemicals, banks, um, whatever industry it might be. And this is really what our, informs our view of what's going on uh, in the world. And I think this is really important, that as investors in Europe, we don't buy units of economic growth. Um, I couldn't care less whether Europe as a region grows 2%, 1.5% or 1%. It doesn't really matter. Because ultimately what I invest in are units of earnings and cash flows. And it's the trajectory and the outlook for those earnings and cash flows that drives our decision making and drives the composition um, of our portfolio. And ultimately, what our goal is, is to find some fantastic businesses in Europe um, that will be part of the um, investment trust. And let me now move and give you some examples of the type of businesses um, we own, um, one of which is Ferrari, which as a brand many of you will have heard of. Um, what often goes unnoticed is the fact that um, this is really quite a unique uh, company. It's probably the only uh, auto company in Europe or in the world that has got real pricing power. Um, the reason why it does have pricing power is because it has waiting lists of 18 months to you know, three years on pretty much all of their models. Um, it can basically decide at the beginning of the year how many units it's going to sell during the year because there's always going to be some high net worth individuals that are missing out on the models they really want. Um, what Ferrari has understood better than most companies is to create real desirability and scarcity um, for their models. Um, and as a result, it generates um, the highest operating profits uh, in the industry. And most importantly, we see a lot of room for those returns um, to continue to improve um, going forward. Now, we had the CEO of Ferrari in our office in Edinburgh in November, um, just to give you a little bit of an anecdote. And that was right at the time when there was turmoil in markets, people were worried, stock markets were falling. And I remember asking him the question, have you seen any changes in consumer behavior in Europe in terms of your order book? And he just smiled at me and said, no, our order book in Europe is hitting record highs as we speak. And this is exactly what I mean. Ultimately, what you're doing by investing in Ferrari is you're tapping into a high net worth individual um, that doesn't really care whether the you know, stock market is down 10, 15 percent. Um, you know, ultimately, there's very strong demand for their products. Um, and this company actually has grown its earnings by 170 percent over the last three years, which is clearly backward looking. But we're still talking about a company listed in a European market um, where apparently there is a lack of growth. The message from me to you is, as active stock pickers, we can find these gems that outgrow the market by a considerable margin 
um, with you know, a good outlook for the next three to five years because we believe that Ferrari has the potential to, again, double their earnings over that period as they're launching new models uh, into new markets um, and with prices moving higher even further. The second company I wanted to touch on is a company called Straumann. Um, again, an example of what we often refer to as a giant in a niche. It's Swiss-based. Um, they're a dental implant manufacturer. They've got about 25% global market share. Um, it's, it's a company that has been in the fund uh, for the last three years. Um, it's been growing its sales organically by about 14-15%. Um, um, it actually reported Q1 numbers this morning, um, growing again organically by 17%. Um, and the reason why we like it is, again, a management team, very clearly defined strategy for how they want to uh, create value for shareholders over time. Um, it's very high returning, converts a lot of its earnings uh, into cash. But importantly, we see a clear run rate of growth over the next three to five years that would suggest that growth is going to stay high double-digit rates. You can see there, they're taking lots of market share because their market is only growing by 3 to 4%. The reason why we have this confidence is because we see them every quarter, and what we learn in those meetings is we learn about the new products they're going to launch, the new markets they're going to go into, and this management team has been really smart um, by deploying capital and acquisitions, which helped them to basically double their addressable market in the last two to three years. So strong run rate and growth going forward. And what I often say to our clients, you know, this has been in the fund for the last three years, I expect it to be there uh, for the foreseeable future, hopefully for many years to come. Uh, and it's a good example of what you do when you find a winning franchise in Europe. You size it large and you just continue running it. Um, and this is you know, what our intention is with Straumann because we see lots of room for value creation going forward. And then lastly, um, we wanted to have a bit of fun um, and put um, uh, as an example of Necobank, which is um, um, an Italian uh, company. Um, it's a little bit controversial in the sense that Italy doesn't strike most people as a natural hunting ground for finding strong investment ideas in European financials. Um, we think Finecobank actually proves that thesis is wrong because it basically benefits from the moribund state of the Italian banking market. Um, it is um, offering consumers three things in one. They've got the, st the strongest trading platform, um, they've got the strongest digital offering, and one of the best um, advice and investment um, um, center networks. Um, and as a result, they're taking lots of market share. Um, so they've got about 1.2 million customers, um, and they, that base is growing by 100,000 customers per year. And with that, um, you can see nice growth in the savings and assets under management, and with that, nice growth in earnings and cash flows. Um, now, why are they winning? They're winning because they've got the best technology. Um, and you know, we often call them um, the bank of the millennials, uh, as well as other rich Italians. And the reason why people go to Fineco Bank is because um, it's got the best digital offering uh, and people like to interact with their financial institutions in a smart, digital way. And actually, it's always surprising um, the degree to which some of the legacy banks fall short uh, on that metric. Now, because it's got one of the um, leanest cost base as well, this company generates a return on equity of 28%. Um, <clears throat> now, that is the key metric you look at when you talk about financials. And just to give you some context, for most of the other financials we look at in the other banks in Europe, uh, that would be 8 to 9% if you think of a top gen or some of the other French banks. So they're clearly you know, earning uh, and compounding at much higher returns um, than their competitors. And we see that continue in the future as well. Now, how can you access those type of ideas? I, I hope you got a good sense of the type of businesses we're looking for. You know, all of them have something slightly unique about them. Uh, and for all of them, we see an attractive path in, uh, with regards to the trajectory in earnings and cash flows. Lots of room for further value creation. So the BlackRock Greater European Investment Trust um, is the vehicle I uh, manage with my colleague Sam Vecht. Um, I've already um, 
talked um, about the fact that it's a fairly concentrated portfolio. We can invest in 30 to 70 stocks, but very much centered towards the better, uh, bottom end um, of that range. What makes this trust slightly different as well is that uh, from time to time we can have a smaller allocation to what we call developing Europe, which is basically emerging Europe, um, that gives you access to some pretty um, fast-growing and very attractively valued assets as well. And then with it being an investment trust, uh, we can apply a gearing as well um, as we see fit, um, you know, up to 15% um, of the NAV. Coming to performance, um, you can see here that um, the, tr the trust has outperformed um, its benchmark by about 6.5% over one year, just under 6% also over three years, which puts it right at the top um, of its investment trust peer group uh, and in the top decile of the broader peer group of about 135 ex-UK uh, funds managed out of the UK. But really, the message um, to you when it comes to performance is that we believe we can achieve the best results for our shareholders um, over the long term. And you can see here the five-year number of close to 12% you know, uh, outperformance, I think, is testament to that statement. There'll always be a period when it doesn't work so well. We believe that we can deliver the best results for our you know, savers um, over the, the medium um, to long term. And with that, um, I uh, conclude, and hopefully we can address some of your questions in the session later on.